While there are countless publications in the literature that deal with the quantification of mitral regurgitation, there's not very much you will find on tricuspid regurgitation. Remember, the tricuspid valve is the forgotten valve. However, in reality, we quantify tricuspid regurgitation very similar as we do mitral regurgitation. So the TR jet looks just like the MR jet. But for review purposes, which components do we have? We have the flow conversion zone. We have the vena contracta, which is the area where the jet goes right through the orifice, the regurgitant orifice. Then we have the jet body, which we can describe via its length and via its area. And similar to the way we quantify MR, we also look at the proximal portions of the jet for the quantification of TR. To help you visually assess the severity of TR, here are four examples of four different degrees of TR. On the left hand side, physiologic or trace TR, you can see only a very small jet. And if you move the transducer just slightly, you might even miss the jet. You don't see a flow convergence zone. Here is mild TR, a bit more. We do see a jet here, but we can hardly see a flow convergence zone. We have moderate TR here, where we can actually see the vena contracta and even measure the flow convergence zone. And then finally, severe TR with a broad jet and a distinct and measurable vena contracta and pisa. Where are the problems and the pitfalls? Well, first of all, you have to consider that the degree of TR varies much more with respiration than the degree of MR. In arrhythmia, the degree can also vary from beat to beat. You will underestimate the severity of TR if you have eccentric jets, just like you underestimate the severity of MR. And you have to be careful because sometimes you have a jet, for example, coming from the left ventricle or from the LVOT or from the interatrial septum, which can mix. And therefore you will have problems to distinguish the two jets from each other. This is such an example where the TR jet interferes with a second jet a jet which comes from the LVOT. This was actually a patient who had aortic valve repair and who had a fistulous connection between the LV or the LVOT and the right ventricle. You can see the jet here and here. And obviously this makes it quite difficult to really quantify the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. And for those out there who really like numbers to quantify the severity of TR, here is the PISA radius and the vena contracta with respect to the different severities. Note that you have to use a certain Nyquist limit because obviously these parameters change if you change the Nyquist limit. Here are the reference values for the Nyquist limits. You can also find this table in your fact sheets. And now I would like to show you how we quantify tricuspid regurgitation in clinical practice. And up front, don't forget, we always start with morphology first. This is how we would assess the morphology of the tricuspid valve. I would start from a parasternal long axis view and then tilt the transducer downwards so we arrive at the long axis view of the right ventricle. Okay, this would be the long axis just for your orientation. This is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium, and this is the tricuspid valve. We have the anterior leaflet here and this is posterior leaflet and depending on how far you tilt up or downwards we can sometimes also see the septal leaflet here but from the aspects of looking at the morphology we can see that the leaflet is just moderately thickened and there appears to be some degree of prolapse here of the posterior leaflet so this is the first view and if we move the transducer, rotate the transducer clockwise, we can look at the my tricuspid valve also in a short axis view. Again, we can assess the morphology, thickening, the motion, and also the subvalvular apparatus. The next view we could use is 
the apical view, the four chamber view, I would try to bring the right ventricle in the middle of the sector, approximately here, and then again take a look at the tricuspid valve. Now we would have the septal leaflet here, and again this would be either the anterior or the posterior depending on how far you tilt the transducer downwards or upwards. So this is a view where you can nicely see the septal leaflet. And from this view, you can then again rotate counterclockwise. Again, try to have the right ventricle in the middle of the sector. And then we get something like a two-chamber view of the right ventricle. Here and here. And if you rotate further, you would get the inflow-outflow view. So this would then be the outflow tract of the right ventricle towards the pulmonary valve. And again, you can see all aspects of the tricuspid valve. In some patients who have very poor image quality, we can also try to image the tricuspid valve from a subcostal position. I'll try to do that now. You see, this is the four-chamber view, the subcostal four-chamber view. And even here, we can take a look at the tricuspid valve. Now that we examined the morphology of the valve in this patient, we'll turn to color Doppler. This is how I would assess the tricuspid valve with respect to regurgitation and color. First again, I would start with the long axis view of the right ventricle. We can see the tricuspid valve. So it's very important to get a good 2D image before you press the color button. And immediately we see that there is some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. And we also see that the jet has an orientation towards anterior. So the direction of the jet is towards the chest wall, anterior. And what we now try to do is we try to see the flow conversion zone, which is not easy to see in this patient. But we can appreciate at least to some degree, the severity, which is certainly more than you would expect from physiologic tricuspid regurgitation, it does not look severe, but probably somewhere in between. Importantly, we see that this very nicely fits to the morphology of the valve. We have prolapse of the posterior leaflet and a jet which is oriented towards the chest wall anteriorly. The next view I would use is, I would use the short axis view of the tricuspid valve. And again, look at the color. Very difficult to judge the severity here because the jet is eccentric. We're not aligned perfectly, which is not possible in this view because the jet is coming towards you. And then I would look at the apical views. So this is an apical four chamber view. Again, we'll try to bring the tricuspid valve into the middle of the sector. And then we can see the regurgitation here. Most importantly are the proximal portions of the jet. That's why I'll focus on them. And you can see here the flow convergence zone and somewhere in here the vena contracta, which does not appear to be very broad, but also not very narrow either. We have something somewhere in the range of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 maybe. So in summary, this would probably be from these views, a um, moderate, mild to moderate regurgitation. Let's also look at regurgitation in the two-chamber view. Appears a bit broader here, maybe. And also in the inflow-outflow view. 
and go back to the four chamber view, which also seems to show that the regurgitation is not holosystolic. So in summary, if we look at all the views, regurgitation would probably be moderate, maybe mild to moderate, probably caused by prolapse of the tricuspid valve. Of course the jet is important, but don't forget, just as we have indirect signs with mitral regurgitation, we also have indirect signs in tricuspid regurgitation. What are they? A dilated right ventricle, remember we have signs of volume overload, a dilated right atrium, and also a dilated vena cava inferior. Of course these signs are not very specific, but they do give you clues how severe TR really is. Here are some other indirect signs of severe TR. First of all, systolic flow reversal into the hepatic veins. You can see that both with pulsed wave Doppler and also with color Doppler. And as a matter of fact, if you inject normal right-sided contrast, you can see the contrast regurgitate far into the hepatic veins. And this example shows you another indirect sign. Not only the dilated right ventricle, but also the flattened septum points to volume overload and therefore severe tricuspid regurgitation. But note that the flattening of the septum does not occur during systole but during diastole. This is in contrast to pulmonary hypertension where we have flattening of the septum during systole. However note that we can also have a combination of systolic and diastolic flattening then we usually have both volume and pressure overload of the right ventricle. And what does the TR signal tell us? Well, we can obviously quantify the severity of pulmonary hypertension by measuring the peak velocity of the signal. But the shape too gives us information. Here's an example of a patient who has a normal peak of the maximum velocity, and here's a patient who has an early peak of the signal. Such a shape is usually seen in the setting of severe tricuspid regurgitation. We have rapid pressure equilibration. The signal has a triangular shape. So if you see this, you can be quite sure that tricuspid regurgitation is severe. Another thing that you should take a look at is the maximal forward velocity across the valve. Usually if you have significant TR, the velocity is also higher. Many of you are probably aware of the fact that the TR signal is ideal to quantify pulmonary pressure and that that is important in very many disease entities. This topic, however, will be discussed in more detail in the chapter on right heart disease. But now, just a few words about the indications for surgery in tricuspid regurgitation. What are the rules? Well, you have to operate before right heart failure occurs. We should operate tricuspid regurgitation if it's more or equal to moderate if heart surgery is performed for other reasons, for example, bypass surgery or a mitral valve surgery. We should not perform surgery anymore if right ventricular function is severely reduced. And repair is better than replacement. Okay, so this concludes the topic of tricuspid regurgitation, but we're not done yet. The next chapter will deal with other pathologies of the tricuspid valve.